I'm not unique in being the singer of the band releasing a new record saying it's my favorite, but it's, you know, it's my favorite record. Uh, it was the most joy that I've ever had in making a record. Um, working with Ross Robinson was such an experience that I'll never forget. Um, I hope we work together more times. If you're already inducted into what we do and, and you're familiar with who we are as a band, I think it's going to feel familiar, but you're going to, you're, you'll be able to catch, you know, pretty, pretty quickly, uh, a new, a new side of us. And then I think if you're new to the band and you've never heard us before, it's a fantastic entry point. You know, I don't, I think, I think it's going to be one of those records that like, you don't have to feel like you had to have been initiated, you know, in 2010, like, oh, I don't know where to start with this band. You know, one of those situations, I think it's a perfect entry point. Do I think about our records as being a chronological telling of my life? Yeah, I, I, I certainly do. I, um, you know, I, I started this band as just as an outlet, as a way to deal with whatever I was going through in those periods of my life. So each one of these records have all been like very time and place. Um, and I've always kind of done my best to not write about people specifically, um, like other people, because, you know, I, I'm, I know that feelings about people change and, and relationships change and whatever, and I never wanted to get stuck, you know, singing about something I don't necessarily think I'm going to connect to years later or something like that. The first record being kind of about um, just kind of everyday depression that I think a lot of people go through and my understanding that I'm not doing anything about it other than complaining about it, which is what I, I feel like I did throughout that whole record. You know, like I'm not looking for any sort of help. I'm just looking to get it out. And so that's why, you know, I'm beating a dead horse in that. Um, because I'm not saying anything new, you know, I'm not, I'm not unique. And then Parting the Sea was, you know, the band is now getting the tour and the band is now on the road and the band is now on the road a lot. Finding solace within that and uh, learning how to handle relationships, family-wise, romantically, all of those sorts of things. It survived by it is much about legacy, how I'm living and how I'm gonna be remembered and all these sorts of things. I had turned 30 when that record came out or was being written. So, I, you know, I think for anyone, I, I, I have to assume a lot of our listeners are, if they're not 30 yet, they're approaching 30, most likely. Um, if I was to look at the, uh, the analytics of our, uh, of our social media presence. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that that record was, was a perfect thing for me to write about at that time, because that's, you know, a big part. A lot of people say when you turn 25 is when you start to reflect on your life. And I, I don't know that I necessarily agree with that. I think 25 is when you're um, starting to become comfortable in your own skin. And, but 30 is when you have to look at the bigger picture, which is what I was doing. And then I, and then the next one, yeah, I lost my mom and, and then, you know, I had to recalibrate my entire existence and uh, come to terms with my own fear of mortality and, and, and all of these sorts of things, and obviously the, the sadness of losing a parent. And now we're at Lament, which is which is uh, me sort of kind of reflecting on all of these sorts of things and what I've written and the relationships I have. And now I do feel comfortable writing about someone close to me because that person is going to be close to me for the rest of my life. So all of these all of these sorts of things factor into Lament and and what that record represents and who I represent as a person at this time in my life. Stage four was was certainly emotionally depleting in a, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, I, I've been saying a lot lately that when I reflect on writing that record, I don't reflect on it um, as like a fun time. <laughs> you know, like I think a lot of people, when they write records, um, you know, d depending what kind of music you write, it, you know, it can be very emotionally demanding or, you know, it could just be fun. I don't necessarily remember like, having a bad time writing the record or anything like that or recording the record. I, you know, I love the guys in my band and I, and I love Brad Wood who we did it with. Um, but I don't have a lot of memories of, of like high five moments or like, you know, anything like that. It was just, for me, it was just, uh, I just say it's, it was necessary. It was my way of, of handling my own grief and 
what I was going through, like it was the easiest record to write and the hardest record to write because easiest in the term of like, there was never, there was never a moment where I didn't have some avenue I could take. It's like, oh, do I write about how I'm feeling about um, visiting her in hospice? Do I write about how I was feeling the day I found out about it? Do I write about how I was feeling um, today as I'm having to go through all her things and clear out the house? And like, you know, there was like an endless supply of directions to write about. So it was, it was in that regard, it was easy because, you know, I, I say I could write six more albums about that, but I don't want to do that. And I don't know that our listener base wants that either. Um, but, but uh, so taking all of that into account, you know, um, now it's four years later and I have to write a new record. And there was just, you know, a, a hard, a hard, um, new understanding on, on how to approach a record with, with like, okay, so I, I just put out arguably the most personal record that I'm ever going to write. Um, the most, you know, heartbreaking record that I'm ever going to write. Hopefully I don't want to test, I don't want to test the universe and try to have them, uh, give me something new to deal with. But I think what this did was it gave me an ample opportunity to reflect on what has happened in my life since releasing stage four. I'm with someone who was there for me throughout that entire process who I'm now engaged to. And um, so that is like a, a positive in my life. Uh, even though the songs on the record are, you know, gracious to, to that, um, you can still find my own version of pessimism towards myself in those songs. Um, but you know, this, but you know, if I was to look at this record, it's like, I, I have the freedom within lament that I had on dead horse and parting the sea where I'm not writing just about one actual specific thing. You know, I can have different themes throughout this record, which was, which was nice and allowed me a freedom that I don't think I had felt in, you know, almost eight or eight to 10 years. Um, so as much as I'm, you know, singing about uh, love in my life. I'm also singing about, uh, you know, like having imposter syndrome, which I, which I think any artist uh, sh should have. I'm not interested in, in any uh, artist who just is entirely too confident. Reminders uh, is arguably the poppiest song our, in our catalog, which was a fun kind of direction to write. It, it wasn't meant to be that way. It just, you know, once, once that song kind of came to be and the chorus was was in my head, you know, it was a matter of like, let's just take it further than we've ever taken the song before. Like, let's make it big and, you know, have fun with that and kind of pull from the influences that uh, we all have within us, but we've never really explored too deeply with Touche. Um, like I always joke that there's, you know, only a handful of bands that, that we all can all agree on. You know, we all listen to such different stuff, but one of those bands that we all like is, is Jimmy Eat World that I think kind of cuts through a little bit in that. That song is like, you know, kind of political in a way. I wrote it the day that, uh, that Trump, uh, didn't get, um, fucking impeached. Uh, and, and it was just built out of that frustration. So like, you know, it was fun to kind of take this record with different avenues. And it was the most fun I've had doing a record because um, everything was exciting. Working with Ross was exciting. Writing the songs were exciting. For that, I look at this record as, as just a completely new experience. And it's nice to have that five records deep. When I was thinking about where to go with this record a long time ago, like in 2008, maybe end of 2018, early 2019, I went to go see Turnstile play. And Brendan, the singer, and I were talking. And I was like, yo, I'm thinking about writing maybe like a love record. And he got excited. He was like, yo, I fucking love that. Like, that's sick. Like, you should totally write a love record. And then I was gonna, you know, kind of make an, a stab at that, which some of this kind of is, but at the same time, uh, making the kind of music that we make, it's really difficult to write a love song because you're yelling and you're yelling in like an aggressive manner and it just feels incorrect, you know? So uh, that was a bit of a challenge, which I, which I enjoyed, but, um, but I think still like, like I had mentioned, like imposter syndrome and just, you know, questioning, questioning who I am at, at every turn is always gonna come through. Um, you know, like with the first song in the record, Come Heroin, like I can't help but say like, but I'm just a risk, uh, a colossal near miss, prone to resist what is best for me, you know, which which is uh, a short history lesson in a lot, in a lot of uh, my past relationships and stuff, you know, like I'm, I'm gone most of the year. I'm, 
you know, I, uh, I, I'm not great with my emotions. I, I, I bottle them up and, and, um, this is my way of always expressing them, you know? Um, so, you know, it's all the, it's all the sort of learning things, but, uh, you know, I found somebody, uh, that, that cha has changed me in a lot of, the, in, in a lot of those ways and has made my life dramatically better. Was I nervous about incorporating elements like the pedal steel? No and yes, because it was one of those things where Nick had, you know, told us he was picking up that instrument, like he was learning how to play it. His best friend got one um, and, you know, I think played around with it, found that he enjoyed it. Uh, and both Nick and Clayton, um, these last couple of years have gone through like a, a deep, uh, like very old classic country phase, you know, where they're like super into like, like extremely obscure, uh, like early, early, early country records. Um, you know, Nick has like the funniest collection now of like probably like 80 year old men playing, playing pedal steel, uh, records, which is incredible. And he goes to like pedal steel, uh, conventions where he's definitely the youngest person there. But yeah, it's like, so he had picked up this instrument. He and I had a discussion, like, uh, you know, when we started writing the record, I was like, do you think you could write a song for the record on that? I think that'd be great. Because I, I think if you look, reflect on kind of starting with Parting the Sea, all of our records kind of have what I would describe as like the weirdo track, where it's like, Parting the Sea, we have a song with a piano, um, which, you know, it's not exactly like the most original thing, but like piano and screaming, that felt like trying to do something a little different on that record. Um, and then is survived by has a song called Nonfiction, which is like, you know, kind of a post rock song, for lack of a better term. Um, and then uh, stage four has Skyscraper, which is which like, you know, it's, it's you can tell it's like influenced by bands like The National. Um, and then this record has a broadcast, which which, yeah, it's, it's written with a it's written with a pedal steel. It has kind of like a, a chanty arcade fiery sort of chorus um and uh but but what happens is when nick wrote the song it was we we're so stoked on it it's so brilliant and, and really pretty and i was all excited about it and then i had the the thought of like gosh shit what am i going to do over this thing <laughs> like and that's what i'm often hit with you know like when, at the moments when when the guys present something truly truly interesting and great I, i'm i'm always beside myself like yeah fuck what am i gonna do these guys have grown so much as musicians and, and artists and everything like that and you know i'm i'm yelling so like i'm you know i'm, I'm i know i'm limited so that being said you know like I, at first i tried like a like kind of like a skyscraper singing thing over it which which i don't know that i fully believed in and then i figured you know, if I just did the, this, take a step back from the, from the mic, kind of just yelling, but not screaming, it'll come off kind of in more of a, in more of a loud poetry sense, which, which I think helped the song kind of take, take, take full form. And then, yeah, so that, that was kind of it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like a, we should really try to, you know, go a new angle with this band or anything like that. It was just, it, it is honestly as simple as like, oh, Nick picked up a new instrument and of course he's good at it because he's one of those assholes that can like, you can hand him an instrument he's never played before. And then in 10 minutes, he'll tell you, he'll be able to play you something. Do I look at forecast as kind of the next part to stage four? Yes, abso absolutely. To me, a forecast I wrote as an open letter to the listeners who were there for stage four and were there emotionally for stage four um the people who connected to it in a way that no one wants to connect to it you know someone who likely lost somebody or in a, any other way you know you could have just enjoyed that record for what it was and that's fine and you understand the, the the concepts a forecast is me not being clever a forecast is me just being very very direct it was the last song i wrote for the record I had three more songs to finish before going into the studio and it was exit row broadcast and forecast. And, uh, and that was the last one that I wrote. And it was just like, I had my notepad in front of me and just, I was, you know, I, once I found the vocal pattern that I was hoping to, to get with the piano thing, similar to the broadcast situation where, you know, I, I had come to Elliot who always plays piano on all of our stuff. And I was like, you know, come up with something just, you know, uh, 
not too intricate, but something just kind of ominous and what, you know, I, I, we, we went back and forth and that was the first thing that he came up with. And I, I thought it was just so gorgeous. And uh, so he and I had, you know, he had sent me a couple different tempos and, and things like that on how to approach it. And once I finally found that vocal pattern, you know, I found myself just sort of like humming it and humming it and humming it. And then once I, once I finally got kind of the, the cadence in my head, then it just like flew out and I wrote it pretty, pretty quickly. There wasn't a lot of edits with that. Um, and, you know, I think if you are someone who follows the band closely and follows, it feels weird to say this, but particularly like me closely, like, even though we might not know each other personally, if you follow what the band does and what I, what my life has been, it feels like a, a I, I like to think of it as like a conversation between friends almost, you know, um, I'm being honest, but I'm also being a little bit, you know, playful. Like I bring, like to break the tension, I bring up, you know, my, my jazz journey and my beloved love for Coen Brothers films, which I've always had. And then I cut right back to something cutting, which is, which I think is something that a lot of us feel, which is that, uh, inner turmoil that a lot of us have with our families when it comes to the political world right now. Um, I don't know many people that haven't had a blowout with a family member uh, on Facebook or wherever, or maybe Thanksgiving. <laughs> and uh, so that felt nice to write. It, it, it felt nice to write and be so candid about that because I think that's something that a lot of people will relate to. Um, and uh and then just the whole outro is just kind of tying up the whole thing where, you know, throughout the years of touring off stage four, the conversations I've had and things I've said on stage and, and all of that, what I, especially around the times of the anniversary of my mom passing and, or the anniversary of the record coming out or, or any of those things, like, I think a, a really important message is that, like, there's no, there's no time limit on grief. There's no, uh, having someone tell you, you know, like, uh, just give it time or, you know, or, you know, time heals or any of that stuff is like the most fucking toxic thing you could say to somebody who, uh, who's going through something like that. So, you know, I'm never going to get over it. I don't think anyone who's ever gone through something like that ever gets over it, you know? Um, so I think the message that I'm trying to, that I'm trying to really get out with the end of the track is basically saying, that it's okay to not be okay and that don't assume that the person in your life that may have suffered a loss 10 years ago, five years ago, two years ago is good. You know, like always check in on your friends and always, you know, be there for them. If, uh, if you, whether you think they need it or not, just a simple text, simple call. Don't even have to talk about what the thing is. Just, just, uh, Hey, I was thinking about you can really do a lot for people. So that's kind of the end result of, of what that is. Is Julian Baker an unofficial member of Touche Amore? I think she's entirely too cool to be in our band, honestly. We adore the hell out of her. She's, she's the coolest ever. And uh, it was one of those things where I didn't want to bug her to, to sing on the record again because she did a, such a solid with Skyscraper. And uh, so I had gone to a few other vocalists um, women vocalists to uh to potentially sing on reminders and and one thing after another they didn't work out or they, they just one thing or another there was a reason why it couldn't happen and uh the song was like already being mixed it was like well towards the end of the record and we were like like i know i need this like like i mentioned earlier with with when we were writing reminders or and we we're in the studio it's like this is such a big chorus like I had a, a, the idea a long time ago where I was like, I really want to have like a woman singing under this with me because it'll just make it like pop, like even louder. It's like, if we're going to, if we're going to go for it, let's like go for it. And uh, so once those things were kept kind of falling through, I was like, who's old faithful? Fucking Julian, I know could crush this. So I went back to Julian and I, and I you know, I, I hit her up and I was like, you know, with the tail between my legs a little bit, like, you did a, such a solid, I know, like, I don't want to overstep. I don't want to, you know, feel like I'm taking advantage of our friendship. 
And of course, she's just the coolest. She's like, send me the song. Like, it's all good. And then, you know, had it back to us within a day or something like that. Just like when we sent her Skyscraper, she did that in an afternoon and sent it sent it back immediately. She's so cool and just crushed it again. So we're, we're forever thankful to Julian for, uh, for not only her talent, for, but for just being just such a team player. Do I fear being completely depleted? Kind of. And I think that ties into the imposter syndrome thing where you sit down with a notepad or a laptop or, or whatever it is and you're, you can't come up with anything, you know? Um, you convince yourself that, you know, have I, have I, is my worth, is it gone? You know, like, do I not have anything left to say? And I think when you have the worst feelings of those moments is when you do start to shine, you know? I think it's when you feel like you have nothing left is when some of your best material is gonna come out.